Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session on Southeast Asia as the powerhouse. Um, so for this session, uh, we have my panelists. What I'll do is to have the ladies first. Karen, perhaps you can introduce yourself, and I'll introduce myself last. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm Karen Tang from Hong Kong, um, uh, from the Better Hong Kong Foundation. Our foundation is to promote Hong Kong, promote the understanding about Hong Kong, and also what is one country, two systems, and basic law. And therefore, of course, uh, we explain also um, the developments in China as well. Yeah. Uh, Keith Rabin, KWR International. Uh, well, I, I began working in Southeast Asia, I guess, in the early 1980s. So I was managing a trading company focused on trade development with Burma at that time, and have since gone on to work on a wide range of projects uh, in Southeast, well, in Asia itself, working for the Trade Ministry of Japan and Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, uh, and other countries as well, and recently. Uh, spent a couple of years doing uh, energy sector development in, in Myanmar. Hello, my name is Philippe Bonnier. I am involved in a number of businesses now. But the reason why I was invited to this panel is that I live a number of years in uh, Southeast Asia when I was in charge of uh, Schindler Elevator for uh, Southeast Asia based in Singapore on traveling extensively uh, all over the region on being able to compare with other countries where I live, which is uh, Japan, uh, China, and India. Hi, I'm Hendra. I'm from Indonesia. Um, I am uh, I guess I'm here because uh, we are a family business. We are in properties, in commodities, in, in uh, food processing, and uh, I'm in charge of the financial services uh, sector. Thank you. Right, and finally, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Alan Lau. I'm the President Director of uh, Anglo Euro Energy Indonesia. We are infrastructure project developers in the energy uh, business. We focus mainly on the natural gas and small scale LNG distribution. Uh, we are also involved in energy efficiency projects uh, for the waste heat recovery. So we are very much oriented on, you know, that at the ground level. And um, also, I'm very much, you know, this passionate about social impact projects. So we are doing low-cost housing for the poor and for the slums, as well as for the, this, you know, disaster relief housing, which we have a venture with the Japanese uh, the construction company to do earthquake-resistant structures. So, so basically, that is our commercial activities. I'm also a member of the UN Economic Commission for Europe in public-private partnership, as well as in the um, group of experts on natural gas. So that basically is my background. What I would like to achieve, because Southeast Asia right now is a very primary focus uh, of, of the world. In, in, well, in fact, it is a block of Southeast Asia would like to, uh, according to the UN uh, Trade and the Commission for Trade and Development, uh, Southeast Asia attracts the most FDI, foreign direct investment, uh, last year, which is more than Europe in terms of the investment into Southeast Asia and slightly more than China. So it makes it the most attractive in terms of figures, in terms of foreign direct investment. Uh, over in the world. So that makes uh, Southeast Asia in itself uh, a very you know, vibrant economic block. And this economic block is represented by ASEAN, which is the, Asso the Association for Southeast Asian Nations, which comprise of uh, Singapore, Thailand, Burma, uh, you know, Myanmar, Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia. And uh, so this, this this block in itself uh, and Malaysia uh, comprise of the ASEAN. And um, what is interesting is ASEAN itself is, uh, has been incorporated for quite a while and uh, they are being backed up by what they call ASEAN plus three, which includes Japan, 
Korea and China, especially in terms of after the financial crisis in 1997 and also in 2008, what they, are, what they feel is that for this whole um, economic block and for each country within this uh, association to grow, you need to mitigate against the risk of the local currency to the foreign currency. Uh, and what they do is basically come up with the mechanism in which you can mitigate against this risk and they have what is termed as the Chiang Mai Initiative, whereby at present there's $240 billion, uh, which are contribution from all the ASEAN countries, in which they use this as a second line of defense against if, for example, if Indonesia, for example, applies to the, I, to the, IM, to the IMF and IMF says, no, uh, we would not want to undertake your sovereign risk, then up to 30% of the funds then can be utilized to basically that Indonesia can draw on. So these are internal mechanisms which are very innovative. And, uh, you know, so these are the, is, it adds to the resilience of, the, of this economic block. The second factor is in terms of the ASEAN trade tariff, it's termed as the, this preferential trade tariff, uh, between the countries is you know, zero tariff for most of the product. There are exceptions whereby you need to protect your local agriculture, you know, uh, industry, etc. But in general, uh, it's you know, zero tariff trade from the, with the uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, but this whole tariff structure is different from the EU because EU is based on a common market whereby you have a common tariff structure. But ASEAN allows, for example, import out of the ASEAN nations, if you were to import that in, each, you can still, each country has still the flexibility to impose their own tariff based on their national schedule. So that still allows for the flexibility. Then China comes into the picture because China says, look, you know, we are the biggest trade bloc and we want to be part of this ASEAN tariff. So it's an ASEAN tariff which includes China as a trade block. So if Indonesia, Malaysia wants to export to China, China will not impose that, that the tariff. So that makes this whole block very, very unique. And of all the ASEAN countries, you're talking about 650 million people, young population, growing middle income. So you, if you're talking about the real growth, it is real economic growth, uh, does not, you know, depend on, you know, I mean, it, of course you still are dependent on the external factors, but less so because you have an internal generated growth, mainly spurred by the growth of the middle income group, young uh, population, uh, high consumers. So th these are the characteristics that makes this ASEAN countries this resilient. So with that, I will stop and I would like to basically um, let each of the members of my panel have their own views and then feel free and we will have, I would like to have more time to answer your questions. Yes, just to sort of expand on what uh, they just said. Um, you know, there basically is, uh, you know, there's several key reasons why one why ASEAN is important uh, as a business investment and uh, politically as well. And, you know, one is, as we said, it's, you know, there's a dynamic uh, growth center, and a lot of it is just from starting from a much lower base. European economy, U.S. economy is fairly mature, uh, and, you know, uh, maybe not Singapore, which is relatively advanced, but Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, Vietnam are coming, are seeing dramatic expansions of the middle class. Uh, but having said that, when you sort of group it all together, it's huge, there are national differences, there are cultural differences, so it's sort of a mistake to come in and say we're gonna go into ASEAN and have like an ASEAN strategy because each country does have its uh, 
own systems, and as we said, has his ability to have tariff structures, and it's not like uh, you know crossing borders in the EU or between states in the United States as well. One of the other uh, issues, which is really, well, I mean, is sort of growing in importance, is uh, you know multinationals over the last few decades have really stepped up their exposure to making things within China. Uh, but now with a lot of growing trade tensions and resistance, uh, there's sort of uh, anxiety of being overly dependent on China. And a lot of that uh, you know, supply chain reconfiguration is moving into ASEAN as well because you have a chance to you know, be, have, be, have proximity to China. You know, in some cases, it's Chinese firms setting up the manufacturing and so that it's you know, uh, Thai manufacturing or Vietnamese manufacturing, even though it's uh, you know, the owners or the people. I mean, it allows easy skill transfer much more easily than moving it to, let's say, Latin America or Africa or someplace else. Um, you know, three, it's rising in geostrategic importance because, uh, you know, with the growing role of China and everything else, there's a lot of countries uh, who are looking at Southeast Asia and South China Sea and being cognizant of it from a security and a, a geostrategic standpoint as well. So anyway, that's a few quick points. Okay. Um, Obviously, as the chairman has mentioned, um, Southeast Asia and especially the ASEAN is the powerhouse. As mentioned, um, uh, it has a GDP of uh, more than 2.6 trillion US um, in 2016. Um, so with the population of uh, 650 billion, uh, comparatively younger generations, um, especially compared to the aging, fast aging populations in Asia. So it's a big potential. But I think the challenge is more the imperatives in the uh, economic developments in different uh, nations within the ASEAN. And uh, within the 11 countries, uh, it was first formed by the richer one, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Philippines, and was it uh, the, um, the more, more the richer one? Uh, who else? Uh, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. But later joined by the other six, which is comparatively poor. But um, as it is a trading block, but the trading seems not very balanced among these nations. And um, around, uh, of course, the biggest uh, trading partner of this Asian bloc is China. But within itself, only 25% of the trade is within the bloc. And 75% is outside the bloc. And most of them are with China. And with China, the import and export is also not very balanced. The import of China to ASEAN is more on the machinery products, the industry products. But the export of the ASEAN to China is more the resources. So how to make this uh, more balanced and to make the trade more sustainable and viable is one of the challenges that the ASEAN needs to think of. And as uh, Mr. Robin just mentioned, is also the multiculturalism and also the political stability is one of the concerns that most business partners will, business people will consider. And the religion differences, the belief differences in the ASEAN bloc is also one of the considerations of the stability in the ASEAN bloc. So it is within the Asian nations. And the other thing is more on the global level, as uh, China-US trade um, tension is on the rise, there's opportunity for ASEAN. The reason is some of the manufacturing of Ch in China is moving to ASEAN because of the cheaper labor costs. And actually, before that, China has been moving up the value chain to make it more business um, to make it more service-oriented and consumer-oriented products. So um, quite a lot of, how to say, more polluted industries are moved to the ASEAN. 
but how to make the developments in Asia more sustainable, um, the water pollution, the air pollution, how to make this um, to be solved, because it has been, um, there, there, there are a lot of examples in China that they could prevent in the future. And I think uh, the last point I, I would like to make is more the competitions and uh, around the world that the ASEAN is facing, including what is, say, um, the Greater Bay Area in China that could attract a lot of foreign direct investments to the neighboring area instead of focusing in ASEAN. Even though the foreign direct investment is increasing, but they are also focusing in certain nations only, like Singapore or Indonesia or even Vietnam. But Vietnam is almost at the maximum of the capacity. So how to resolve all this is the challenge of the ASEAN bloc. And uh, with the technology developments, and there are a lot of uh, e-trading, there could be risks and there could be opportunity. Say for example, our friend in India and uh, in Indonesia, they have the um, micro payment because there is not enough, no, no incumbent uh, credit system, just like in China, because they don't have uh, much um, comprehensive credit system. So they have all this WeChat Pay, Alipay, and to solve the credit system. So there could be opportunity like this to make it a cashless society. So people have to be more innovative. But at the same time, this technological development it needs a lot of uh, um, infrastructure support, including whether there will be immediately going for 5G, how this could be um, developed. Will the Belt and Road uh, initiative could be an opportunity for them because it's not just on the road infrastructure, but could be on the communication infrastructure. So with this um, background, I think the ASEAN have a lot to think how to make use this uh, opportunity, turn the risk into opportunity. <clears throat> so I agree with Mr. Rabin that the, the trade, the ASEAN, um, is, is an advantage, but at the same time, every, everybody has it. I mean, you have it in Europe, you have it in, uh, in Mercosur, in South America, you have it in Africa, you have it in NAFTA, so, so I think it's, it's, yes, it's good, but it's not a decisive advantage. What, what I like for Southeast Asia when I, I, I start to live there and, and travel there is that it's a dynamism, especially if you compare it to Europe or if you compare it to the USA or even Japan or Latin America. The, the, the motivation of people is absolutely uh, outstanding. And maybe like in the USA in the 50s, after the war. Um, my, my absolute favorite country is uh, Singapore. I'm an absolute fan of uh, Singapore. Um, I think that we speak a lot about the economic success, and I think it is uh, true. But for me, equally important is the religious harmony, that you don't have fight between religion, and, and it's not the case in every country. It's also the racial harmony. Even though there are three basic races, still have a lot of harmony among the races. And I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous achievement of, of uh, Singapore. The honesty of the country, the stability, the, the meritocracy, the, the, the way of, of having competent people, promoting competent people. So I think it's an absolute, uh, um, it's an absolute model for me. Um, <clears throat> to some extent, all, all the Asian countries, are, Southeast Asian countries, are quite, quite uh, competitive. And in a way, they are complementary. As, a, as an investor, as, as a person who, who works for, for large companies, the obvious choice is to, okay, let's choose Singapore for the Asian headquarter, at least Southeast Asian headquarter, but Singapore has no market. One has, uh, and it's not a place to manufacture, it's not a place, it's maybe more for headquarter, maybe high level research, but the markets are nearby. There are, of course, all the big country, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam. Uh, they also have uh, competent people for manufacturing, advanced manufacturing uh, at lower cost than what you can find in Singapore. And I think it's also quite good that there is a strong link between, between the region and, um, and the main Asian country, or the big Asian country like Japan, Korea, and um, China. 
because if you can produce, manufacture in Southeast Asia and easily export to those uh, big countries of the same continent, it's, uh, it's an advantage. Waiting for someone, yeah, there we go. <laughs> I couldn't stop. Anyway, um, I'll speak on, on our, our uh, viewpoint as a business owner in, in Indonesia, uh, which is being probably the largest country in the ASEAN bloc in terms of population. Uh, I, I heard a few times the word, uh, the term religion, uh, the, the, on the religion aspect of the region. I think one we have to remember, uh, Indonesia, in fact, the Portuguese were there, the Dutch were there for 350 years. We had our Hindu period, some of the most important Hindu, and also we had the Buddhist period, uh, uh, temples are in Indonesia. And of course, now we are the world's largest Muslim country. But being a Catholic and being a minority uh, Chinese there, uh, I think the, the level of tolerance and, and, and openness uh, to communication and so on is, is actually superb. It's, it's not absolute. And, and, and it does not really get in the way of, of us doing business. We, we started in agriculture. We, we used to export a lot, and now we just focus on the very fast-growing uh, local market. And um, I think that is something that, that we have to take into account. And also, I think what, what Keith uh, was saying about diversity, or was it Matthew? And uh, I, I, I talked to uh, an author uh, I mentioned to the panel, uh, Ted Fishman. He wrote China Inc. back in 2000. Because he, he spent some time uh, doing his Princeton days in Yogyakarta. And I asked him, why, Ted, why don't you write a book on Indonesia? It's supposed to, I mean, it couldn't be that much different in terms of the challenge uh, as writing a book on China. And he said, no, no, you're wrong. Indonesia has so many cultures, languages, customs, and so on. It's, it's, it's a very, very complex uh, task. And I think until now, 10 years later, he, I think he's still writing the book. Yeah. So uh, that, that is, shows the complexity of, of the various, not only the countries, but also the various regions in, 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 uh, in ASEAN bloc. And lastly, um, in terms of benefits for, for uh, Asia, I think as Karen said, I mean, that's a big concern because as business owners, we don't really see it. I mean, they, there's Toyota making uh, fortuners in Indonesia, exporting them to Philippines, taking advantage of all of these tax uh, uh, benefits. But there are only a very few companies that are non-multinationals, original companies, that are able to take advantage of this uh, tax, uh, tax uh, or duty, uh, or this community. And also from China, you're, you're right. I mean, we are becoming, we're importing pollution, right? We are exporting away our natural resources and eroding, of course, our, our, uh, our uh, soil and, 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 uh, and, and water. So that's, those are definitely big concerns. Thank you. Right, because, you know, of course nowadays we talk about in terms of the globalization and versus the, pro, that the protectionist policy, uh, America first policies. But in spite of that, what is interesting about Star Wars Asia, like for example, I just give practical example, like Harley Davidson, of course, wanted to set up a manufacturing plant in Thailand. Of course, Trump was against it. I have not followed up what is the outcome, but I think gradually they realize they, so what, you know, of all the world, which they can do, the first country that they go to, you know, Thailand. And of course they have the Mercedes assembly plant, you have the BMW assembly plant in Indonesia as well. So, and another example is like Dyson, you know, the uh, home appliance equipment manufacturer, your, uh, the vacuum cleaner, Dyson, and Dyson fan. Now they're looking into investment in the new generation of electric cars. So they're looking into Singapore as a center for them to manufacture the, as, as a base the electric cars. So again, from the UK per, that perspective, first country that they look at, again, is in Southeast Asia. 
Uh, IKEA have got serious investment now in Vietnam, whereby they're looking at the port, in the warehouse, and they're looking into quite a few hundred million in excess of half a billion uh, dollars for investment. Uh, and they already have a large, large store in uh, Indonesia. So these are practical examples. Uh, even the Korean companies are looking into uh, Indonesia. Vietnam is also another very fast growing that because don't forget when economies mature, where costs, when wages increase, uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's still all these countries that really attract. So the question then that you may ask, what are the, what are the impact of the trade wars? Is that really benefiting Southeast Asia? The answer is, in generally, yes, because you see in the flow of investment, this is the reason why the FDI still uh, is flowing into this region. But on the other hand, it's up to each individual country to form their own regulation, to give incentive to the investors. That part is the flexibility which is open for competition of each of the ASEAN members. So they have to formulate their own regulation and their own incentive to attract foreign investment. What is important is the pol political stability. A good example, you have investment into Vietnam. There is political stability. Um, you have investment into Malaysia. But Myanmar is hurting because of certain political the perception, especially over the ethnic issues, that there is much, much lesser investment into Myanmar. But at the end of the day, it cannot be denied that this, is, this whole ASEAN bloc, and with the support of China, Korea, and Japan, and now Australia and New Zealand are also observers, uh, along with Bangladesh and, and India. So this are the realities right now. So yes, there are benefits uh, that, grow, that come up from the trade war subject to the regulations of each of these nations. So with this thought in mind, I would like to bring it to the floor and I would like you to have your comments. Please have a, fr a free flow of ideas and expression. Yes, please. I'm, I'm interested that you, you shared that the biggest investment in the world went into the region. Any particular sectors that that was focused on? Into e-commerce, <laughs> the, yeah. this IT, but manufacturing <laughs> as well. Um, so it is quite across the broad, but in terms of the growth of the unicorns and, and all that, it's the, fast, it's the fastest growing. I mean, Indonesia with a population of about 260 million, I mean, a young population, and they are very, very savvy. I mean, you go to the villages, everybody is, it is savvy. And in fact, they use, they use the, tech, the, the technology well, because if, for example, in a village, if there are potholes, in the village and is not repaired within a month, they will send the picture to the authorities. <laughs> so this is, again, the growth of the whole technology and the application. But it's just for the government to really set regulations because, and don't forget, the, the history and the legal structure of, of these countries are different. Singapore, Malaysia were all part of the Commonwealth, right? So they work on the common law. Indonesia, is under the Dutch. So they follow the codified, the, you know, the civil law system, the codified law, which means everything has to be regulated. There must be government regulation. If there's no government regulation, you cannot apply that. So it is fairly rigid, but very detailed, very precise. So, so these are some of the factors too. I mean, I give a good example. Right, because every country is right now talking about climate change, green energy. I mean, okay, fine. So I'm involved in an energy efficiency project. I'm converting waste heat from the cement plant in Indonesia into power, which I'm selling back, you know, to uh, the power authorities. And there is carbon credit. There is, but the trouble is I cannot monetize this carbon credit because there's no platform for me to do that. And it's costing me like a few million, you know, uh, that I have to absorb and put that 
to treat it as a cost, which can be actually if it's being monetized, then that you know becomes funds you know that to undertake that this project. So these are the real issues that uh, what I mean by regulation that you can have, have all the good intent, you know, looking into the right type of projects, uh, you know, lowering down your greenhouse gas emissions. But at the end of the day, if there's no regulation there, very little can be done. Wells, unlike uh, the other countries, they're very, very proactive in terms of that because they, 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 they don't need to work on the codified system. So again, these are some deep issues that one has to be aware of. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of money also going into infrastructure, and I, and I think you have to look at it in sort of two broad themes. You know, one being supply, being manufacturing, and one being demand, which is the expansion of, uh, you know, consumer growth in these countries. And, you know, the old model, which Japan followed, Korea followed, Taiwan, of just sort of revving up exports and not really attending to domestic growth and services is no longer uh, viable um, because of trade and concerns over deficits and everything. And for many years, I mean, one of the key things we would emphasize is the shift from supply to demand, uh, being that, uh, yeah, the, you, you know, you can go to Southeast Asia to lower costs in manufacturing, but the same thing, there's tremendous consumer growth. There's young populations, um, and, you know, it's starting from nothing. So Myanmar, for, you know, went from... I think it's like 5% cell penetration to 90% plus in a couple of years, right? I mean, it's just tremendous. And still, I mean, like electricity penetration in Myanmar for the grid is about 30, 32% for 51 million people. And the, you know, the it's not just the political stability issues that are problems. We can talk a lot more about Myanmar if you want. Um, but the point being is now, because of the China issues and the concern over trade, the you know supply side is picking up again in Southeast Asia as well. So in a way, you have the best of both worlds, the opportunity to invest in supply capacity to export to other places, but just to participate in you know enormous consumer growth in particular ASEAN countries. I mean, you can't look at it, I don't think, uniform. But this is double digits for decades to come, and you can't say that about Europe or the U.S. or many other places. Uh, I, I have one question linked to China and also that could I say the political position of ASEAN countries, especially nowadays when uh, we, we have done, our companies have done quite a lot of business there in fintech area and I start to see that for example Chinese companies are more and more active but then at the same time I know the political situation that uh, that's, um, uh, they have been certain certain for example security policy issues with China but now when the US politics is also a little bit different for example to protect some of the countries how you see this development that what is a kind of, could I say, global political position of ASEAN countries in the future? You know, speak, in my experience, having spent a lot of years there and working, I mean, there's a real desire within ASEAN for greater European and U.S. involvement in fintech, in financial services, in, in everything, basically, uh, you know, in order to avoid being overly dependent on China, essentially. Uh, and Koreans and Japanese are trying to push for that as well, because uh, otherwise they're left alone, right? Uh, you know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I mean, Chinese have money and desire and they're more uh, flexible in terms of how to do their business. Uh, and, you know, in a place like Singapore, I mean, in Singapore too, I mean, basically, you know, their main strategy is to be the place that makes sense and that you has good governance and everything, which can then let you branch out into a lot of, you know, countries like Indonesia or uh, Myanmar or other kinds of countries, which, I mean, it's changing now and getting much better, but would allow you to uh, 
bypass board approvals and fiduciary types of concerns and things like that. So, I mean, in terms of policy, I mean, what, you know, I say they, they it, I, I think the problem is more on the U.S. and European side in terms of the ability to come in and interest and the ability to dedicate, because doing business is not simple in these places and it takes time and they're still very much relationship societies, you know, just come in and shake hands and do business and then if it doesn't work, you go to the lawyers, right, which is, I mean, it's certainly more the case in the U.S., maybe a little less so here. Um, but uh, I would say, you, you know, certainly U.S. companies, and I'm not, you Europeans are a little bit more active. Uh, you know, the opportunities there, they just have to dedicate themselves to coming in and to entering. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... <sighs> The the problem with with the quote unquote richer countries is that they they still look at Southeast Asia as you know what what they would read in you know in the uh, story books and, and so on and they thought oh they have the best systems and so on and and uh, for example like our government came, created a national payment gateway because for us it doesn't make sense why payments between Indonesian uh, citizens and, uh, and the shop should go through an American system, American-based system. We, and then, um, but soon enough, we will hear we hear statements from the Chamber of Commerce of uh, U.S. and so on. Say, oh, you will have an increased risk of terrorism and this and that. And in fact, there are a few lawsuits, uh, <laughs> I believe. And I think that's, I mean, that's really the wrong approach. Uh, on the positive note, though, on the SMEs. So SMEs not only from China, which you mentioned, but also Korea, uh, Japan, and also from Europe, uh, uh, surprisingly, and a few from America. And they are actually uh, focusing their uh, startups or their, their new exp expansion market in Southeast Asia. So uh, bringing in ideas and, and uh, leveraging on the local markets, the talents, and, and, and eventually, I hope, it's, it's, there'll be a lot of uh, knowledge uh, transfers also. So those, I think that that is, uh, should be the, fu that will be the future. Thank you. I have some comment about what you, you said before, maybe. I think that if there is a trade war between China and the USA, I think overall it is bad. It's bad for China, it's bad for, for the USA, it's bad for the world. For the world. But of course, some, some people may be winning. I mean, sometimes Germany may win because, uh, because um, <clears throat> um, sometimes maybe uh, if you cannot have a factory in, in, in China, so you have it in Indonesia. So it's, it's some, some country may punctually win or some, some sector. But overall, I think it's, it's not good to have a trade war for the, for the world. Regarding the incentive to, to, to attract, that every Southeast Asian country should have some incentive to attract uh, FDI, foreign direct investment, I think it is certainly true. But provided the incentive, I would say, uh, um, sustainable, like uh, stability, like uh, freedom to, 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 to have the type of company you need, I know that in some country like Indonesia, I understand, not Indonesia, sorry, Malaysia, if, if you create a company in a, in a number of sectors, you need to have a majority of Bhumibhutra. I think that, that this really fully discourages uh, potential investors, even before considering uh, more details. On, I know that also in, in, in some cases, if you create, uh, let's say, a factory or something important, you may have a very big tax rebate. But what I don't like with those tax rebates, if I take the point of view of the, of the country, if I take the point of view of the companies, good to take, of course. But if I take the point of view of the country, if you give a, a very strong tax rebate on your track companies by having very strong uh, of those type of incentive, um, it, it may not be sustainable. And usually they are done for political reason because you may have a president or a minister in place. He wants to maximize the number of FDI during his tenure. But by doing so, by having such a distortion 
it's not, it's not sustainable over the long term when it creates distortion among companies within the same countries, between foreign companies and local companies. So I think that they should be a rather exceptional than a, a systematic instrument to attract FDI. I'd like to supplement a little bit because uh, Hong Kong is um, set to be the financial center and actually is serving Asia. And uh, of course, um, because of uh, China is also using Hong Kong as a platform to go outside and also attracting people to come to China through Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is almost like a springboard and finance is the strong area of, of um, uh, Hong Kong finance, financial center. So when, when we talk about FinTech, is finance and technology. And when we talk about the FinTech, now Hong Kong is pushing, um, promoting on FinTech. But originally, it has a lot of uh, banking system already in place. What they need for the FinTech is how to complement each other but to use the similar regulations. The regulations is very important. Um, if it is not fully regulated, um, like in China, they have a lot of innovations, uh, the WeChat Pay, the Alipay, and also a lot of microfinance over there. But there are some online uh, micropayments which bankrupt. How to manage all this crisis is very important to set the rule at the beginning when we talk about fintech. So um, I, I mean it's important to set the rule first, but whether it should everything go through the government is really very debatable. But on the technology is the security. But um, as we all know, the debate on the Huawei and the 5G, um, is, it was set the career is uh, benefiting because of this uh, debate. So what will happen, we don't know. Is a raising worldwide, um, who will go first? Yeah. I'm actually going to ask uh, a topic on the geopolitical situation. Uh, in regards to the South China Sea dispute along the, uh, the, the Southeast Asian countries' borders, right? Uh, now, we. We also have our own issues, like from Indonesia with Malaysia, and I think our fishery ministry uh, minister has done a wonderful job in stating the fact that which is our territory and which is not, you know, the territory of other countries. But it seems like within the Southeast Asian countries, there's still a question mark of, you know, whose territory is whose. And seeing the way that China has moved down south, because there's a lot of obvious you know, strategic reasons and oil and gas uh, reasons also in, that, in those areas. I'm just wondering from anyone in the panel, uh, if you guys, what do you guys think about this? Because I mean, if the Southeast Asian countries continue to kind of you know, have the, our own skirmishes within each other, while China is just kind of like moving down uh, to the Southeast, uh, uh, claiming islands and claiming the territories, that obviously will somewhat impact the, the, the trade market. These are issues that are present and it will stay. Um, there are issues not only in the South China Sea, there are issues uh, between even the member countries, uh, like Vietnam issues again with China. But in spite of all of these issues, you know, that the, the genome that is in the genes of the Southeast Asian, in spite of all the differences and the, and the diversity, that they are very practical oriented people. That in terms of that, yes, uh, they, are, they are mindful. Even investment in China, I mean, you know, uh, especially the external look at these countries and think that the Southeast Asian government will just simply accept investment as it is with open arms. Uh, Indonesia, for once, are assessing very, very closely. Um, and I work through another form of innovative finance through public-private partnership, whereby uh, the government gives the grantee. It's an issue. It's the only structure that the government gives the grantee in Indonesia. And this is under President decree. And the private sector invests. 
and I can use the World Bank to underwrite some of these project risks. Now, I'm just saying this as examples that there are mechanisms to attract investment. It's just not purely from China itself. There are other ways and in which every country have their own uh, you know, approach for, to accept the foreign investment. Uh, but in terms of all these political issues, it will always be there. But at the end of the day, China will be the major trading bloc, not only for the Southeast Asian country, it will be for Asia Pacific. This whole site, it's, you know, the whole um, focus, the whole not only geopolitical, geoeconomic focus, you know, the whole axis of Asia Pacific region and China will be the dominant partner. And, and the sooner some of these countries they, that just realize this, then in other words, you can accept investment and you can manage the investment. Each member state will still be in control. It would not be like, for example, the case over in Sri Lanka where you talk about the port issues that has been blown up. But that is because the Sri Lankan government did not control that well. They have their own internal conflict. But this will not happen. I bet you not in Malaysia because like Dr. Mahathir have already cancelled some of these projects and, they have, and he has laid the line of what is a proper investment and what is not proper investment, right? Indonesia are very, very thorough. They, I mean, the finance minister of Indonesia is the former managing director of the World Bank in Washington. So she has her own sources of funds, like recently for the disaster relief, emergency funding because of the earthquake. The World Bank underwrites one, that one billion for the disaster, this relief. And they did this very, very fast. So yes, she, all the resources are in place. And, uh, but again, I support that each member state must manage their own in foreign investment well. They must be mindful of what are the consequences. Um, and I also, you know, the Chinese investment, when they actually implement projects, some of them even export their workers, even as sweepers, to do their power plant. They have their sweepers. All these, you know, menial tasks are run by Chinese. And that upsets a lot of the local communities. And I've always bring this up even to the, at the United Nations level. But again, th these are government provincial company so I guess perhaps they need to have, you know, they have to look into all these issues. Yes, I mean, it's not perfect, there are issues, but at the end of the day, each country got to manage their own um, acceptance and their own structures that they can put in place for foreign direct investments. Sure, carry on, please. Yeah, um, you know, in places, let's say like Myanmar or Laos or Cambodia, I mean, there's fewer options and they are dealing with these mega Chinese projects. So right now there's a lot of debate going on in Myanmar of the Miyatsoni Dam in the north, uh, which was agreed to and then was sort of put on delay in 2011 or 12. And now uh, there's being tremendous pressure put on uh, on San Suu Kyi and NLD government to move forward while, you know, there's severe opposition pretty much throughout the country on that. But the question really is what are the alternatives? So when you, you know, and I would say also that while there's clear investment case to be made throughout the region, a lot of the interest of the U.S. and I would say Japan too and others is due to concern over South China Sea and what's going to happen with that. But it, it's a really hard problem because, uh, you know, how far can, uh, well, I mean, you know, and you see what happened with the Philippines with it and, uh, you know, how confrontational does one want to be? Is the U.S. and you know, like, you know, really back it up. I mean, who knows? And as uh, Alan says, China is going to be dominant. They have the interest and the capital and the desire to to push forward. So it's a real key issue. But that's the front line, in uh, in a sense. As and where it's going to go uh, remains to be seen. 
Thank you so much. Ilona from One Million Women to Tech. Mm. So we have about 30,400 women from 145 countries in our education programs. I'm therefore quite new coming from the US to this beautiful region, just trying to understand. I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit now, the, the relationship with, with China is, is quite clear. Um, just if you could say a few words, what is the relationship, if any, um, with India, given that it's it's close to you, it's huge. Supposedly, it will be the largest country by GDP by 2050. And so for the next generation of women, I'm just trying to understand. And the other thing is, how about, um, how do you feel about the relative development with African countries, such as Nigeria or Ethiopia, that have very large populations, will probably jump a lot, and they still have the advantage that their per capita GDP on a purchase power parity is lower. So yours is about from 4,700 for Cambodia to about 13,000 on average. Theirs is, you know, not yet 2,000, 2,500 per annum. Is, is, is there any competitiveness going on with, with Africa? If you, so a little global insight would be great. Thank you. Any comments? You know, uh, traditionally China has been the main focus in there. India, though, it does have now a look east policy is doing its best to try to, uh, ex you know, uh, step up their activities. Uh, in Myanmar, it's been somewhat successful. I wouldn't say as successful. They're coming from way behind where China is and don't have the resources and the, and the push for it. I'm not really sure what you're asking about Africa, but I mean, you know, it, it does, you know, if you're looking at just cost-based competitiveness, Africa is certainly cheaper, right? Uh, but, you know, I would say also, you know, cost of labor is only one factor. So, you know, the, the point with Southeast Asia is very close to China, Korea, you know, uh, Japan supply chains. There's a lot of infrastructure already related. I mean, and we look at, I mean, Myanmar, which is one I know a lot about, is, uh, yeah, the, the labor is very cheap there, but the roads are pretty bad, the ports are not so good, there isn't reliable electricity, the laws are not, uh, are still sort of in formation. So, you know, to just make these opinions, you know, these uh, decisions based on labor cost alone is not, uh, you know, it's important, but it's one of many factors. I think you brought up a good point as well about India. You know, why, why is there not as much focus on, on investment from India as China? Um, the Southeast Asia has been under hin this Hinduism for as long as 800 years or something. You know, it's, it's, it's a long tradition. So, of the, so there's acceptance of the culture because these are the, that forms the roots of a lot of Southeast Asian countries. Um, so India right now, they, there's not much of an investment because they are looking, because the government has to take the lead, there's lacking, unlike China. Uh, China is very, very proactive. But, I, but before I touch on China, I just want to mention one point that Malaysia and Thailand, they have a joint concession for the oil, which has been working very well for the last, you know, 30 over years, whereby it's just a border, just a cross between, you know, southern Thailand and the northern side of Malaysia. This is on the uh, eastern side. And instead of having dispute over such oil concession, they say, look, let's just have a joint, you know, the production, and let's share in that, share the cost and share in, in the profit. And that has been working very, very well. So this is a good example that there are practical examples that have, that, 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 you know, that, that has worked. On the issue of India and Africa, I think China's approach to Africa is somewhat different. And, and it's them, they're looking to infrastructure, looking at the whole, they have their own uh, agenda. Southeast Asia at this time, because each country of them are still emerging, is still an emerging and developing economy. So this is why they are not looking so much into the, in, that investment there. But whilst I say that, coming to the natural resources like oil and gas, Petronas is operating in 38 countries across the globe, from Africa to Canada, US. You know, so the national companies 
that have reached to a certain mature stage. And now Patamina in Indonesia are also looking for foreign investment uh, into the Middle East uh, and elsewhere. So again, yes, they are driven by, but this is driven by companies, not so much by the governments. So that is where it, you know, that it is. I think, uh, but of course, I think it would be great if Africa can come in and look into Asia for their, for the co for, for their economic cooperation. I think that will you know, also be the next, perhaps, uh, growth that uh, can be fostered. Um, I think long before China was even in the map, uh, India, Indian companies in particular, have investments throughout Southeast Asia in textile uh, mills um, and uh, machinery. Yeah, they, they've been around for a while. So, so, so much so that they, thought, they were thought to be local companies. In terms of Africa, uh, a lot of Indonesian businesses are looking at Africa as a market. And just last night, uh, well, we, Sinartus <laughs> and I, uh, my, uh, we're, were <laughs> having fun uh, with our friend from uh, uh, Ghana, as, uh, telling him that no, your your instant noodle is actually an Indonesian brand because it has entrenched so much. We have a brand called Indomie, which is our instant noodle. It's been it's entrenched so much in the African countries that they thought it's theirs. And uh, along with uh, consumer uh, items like soaps and so on, so Africa for Indonesian companies actually uh, is like the, the the next market because we find it a bit too hard to go to the more pro protected uh, mature markets. Thank you. I would just like to perhaps talk about practical examples again. Uh, let's talk about projects because. The external view of Southeast Asia, or there's you know risk, there's you know, but at the end of the day, there are very mature system through the multi-development agencies. A good example is the project bonds uh, approach that is initiated by the Asian Development Bank. They form a consortium of banks where only the ADB takes like 20%, and the rest are all shared between the commercial banks. The Japanese banks are involved, the Singapore Sovereign Fund is involved. So this they group to, that together, and what they say is that let, let's issue this project bond to look at infrastructure projects and to be paid in local currency. Because they do not want that country to be overexposed, learning from the lessons. Because at the end of the day, currency is used as a political tool. Let's face it, like what's happening to Turkey now. So, so of the resilience, they, these bonds are issued and paid in local currency. It's not in the perfect form yet because they have certain quota for certain countries, but it just shows how the multilateral is working to, together hand in hand with, on the commercial side to basically mitigate their risks. And these are very practical approach, mechanism to implement and to fund infrastructural projects. I'm just giving that as one example because that, that is in you know, existence. It's called C, CGIF, uh, you know, that is a part of, of the World Bank, sorry, of the Asian Development Bank uh, that has this venture with uh, the other commercial banks. So there are lots of funding is not an issue. What is a problem is to get good bankable projects even with the good intention from the government to initiate this through their own state-owned enterprise, but then it's a holistic approach where you've got to look at the regulations. Is that there to hinder or are you there to foster it? You, you've got to look into how can you borrow in one currency and then pay in the other currency. And you know, hedging costs is not cheap either. So these are all practical considerations. Karen? Yeah, I would, I would like to add on, even though um, in the other room is talking about the zero, but here we also can talk about the, um, China's uh, Belt and Road um, idea, because uh, ASEAN actually is at the southbound of the route. So um, the chairman talked about the Asian Development Bank, and China also initiated to set up the AIIB, 
and which also fund the projects which uh, the other organization um, did not fund or couldn't couldn't fund. And Can you just explain um, a bit more on the AIB? Uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Yeah, right. So it's uh, initiated by China, but joined by many countries. So with the AIIB, and a lot of projects can be initiated, including um, even though Malaysia's uh, rail um, has been stopped, they just signed another one. So is uh, I think is the different government is the political stability that we are talking that they have a different idea of what the rail should be done, and as the chairman also mentioned, um, Chinese and the Asians are very pragmatic. Economic development is more important. I think. Uh, even though it's a little bit strange, but the president of Philippines is the first to say, let's put aside the political issue and let's co-develop uh, the economy. So it is this kind of attitude, I think, that's uh, prevailing in the area, in the region, which helps to make the collaborations uh, environment more feasible. And uh, there, there could be rail, speed rail, um, the oil pipes, uh, the water electricity um, in Miyama, and which are happening now. So with this infrastructure, I think it helps the developments, economic developments of the region. I just want to add, this AIB, that a lot of misconception, because this is the new World Bank, if, if, that if you like, uh, and every member have, have signed to the agreement, which includes the US. Um, now, out of the last time when I spoke to the president uh, in, in Jakarta for a meeting, he mentioned that out of the 28 projects that they have funded, only one is in China. So that being the case is, I would say, European companies, I mean, you know, I, why don't use it, <laughs> you know, use, use the the uh, EBR, I mean EBRD or your European Investment Bank to have a, have a venture because basically the AIB really, they, they also lack resources. So their approach right now is to do co-financing. That is their whole approach. So use a European bank co-financed co by the AIB and handle your infrastructure projects here. You know, so actually the solutions are very, very practical. But right now, there's this whole fear. Oh, what is this one belt and road thing? Will the Chinese come to you know de dominate and the, and the media have blown it up in a very negative way? But but if but if I'm a European company or a European government and I know that there are projects that I need just to do, why don't explore all your resources and do a co a co financing between your local bank and and the AIB? You know. Anyway, I mean, this is just my <laughs> just my my thoughts on, on this matter. Flip. Yes, I, I fully agree with what uh, Karen said. <clears throat> On he, he actually, if you look at some report from the United Nations, there are hundreds of territorial disputes. On in most cases, economic relations happen normally. For instance, there is a territorial dispute between Japan and, and, and Russia, and it has been lasting since the war. I think it will not be solved before many many years. But still, there there are. They have very good relation between both countries. It continues to trade, uh, investment continues. On anyway, I think that for most countries, it's very, very difficult to, to make pressure on big countries like USA, like, like China. And if you look at the history, if you can, you can leave a small country, Kosovo can leave from Croatia. But to leave from a big country is nearly impossible. And if you do it, um, like Tibet would like to do, normally you lose your independence. So if from China in history, um, Vietnam left from China, they became part of France. Uh, Korea left from China, they became part of Japan. Mongolia became part of uh, Soviet Union. So it's very difficult for, for the international community to pressurize uh, uh, big countries because the commercial interests are so strong. Hello, uh, my name is Ciprian Costa. I came from Romania, but I am uh, 
very close to Southeast Asia, especially to Taiwan. And uh, this is why I am very interested in this panel and uh, I tried to, to do my best to arrive. I would like to ask your opinion about how do you think that the new version of the Trans-Pacific Partnership will have any effects on, uh, on the Southeast Asian countries' development? And the second point that I would like to hear your opinion about is uh, how do you think that the southbound policy of Taiwan will have any effect on the international relations, especially in uh, Southeast Asia? Thank you. Well, in terms of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I think that thing is, you know, what is like to flog, uh, flogging a dead horse because that was initiated not by China, the initiation. So let's, I mean, let's face it, you know, if it's not being initiated from, from that basis, whatever form it takes or the new version or whatever, I, I mean, I for one, I, 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 you know, I think because China have already initiated other versions, um, Indonesia I have also initiated uh, certain economic cooperation for the Asia Pacific, which includes China. So there are other approach. The idea is that uh, from the first version, the United States of America withdraw their signature and uh, it not uh, came into effect. And yes. uh, then the other countries uh, signed a, a new agreement which incorporates many of the initial provisions. But uh, in, 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 in the real life, I think that uh, there is still no effect of uh, that yeah, I think let's, partnership. Uh, yeah, let's not flog a... I mean, to me, I'll put it very, very disdirect. You know, it's like you know, flogging a dead horse. But coming to your issue on the Taiwan, we, do, we you know, really do not want to discuss the whole politics here. But in terms of uh, the growth, I mean, you know, Taiwan have, have their own level of their growth and they have managed their own that economy. And it becomes a political issue. So basically, you know, I mean, anything to do with politics, with conflict, will lead not to growth, will not lead, you know, but to all these, you know, detention. But at least coming back to the South China Sea, so far the tension has been managed because China is not escalating it. There's the, there, yes, there has been incidents, uh, but these incidents are, you know, taken care of. Uh, a, a good example, I, I'll just give you practical examples, because if they intrude into the Natuna waters in Indonesia, you know, and especially over the, also in the, you know, fishing and the fisheries issues, the Chinese patrol boats came into Indonesian waters and to basically ram into the local, you know, coast guards. So they, that creates an issue, but Indonesia is practical. They don't make a big fast about it, they, they do the protest. Because at the end of, see, you must realize, at the end of the day, China is a large country. I mean, I'm involved in the natural gas business, and there is directive from the Central Committee. O open your terminal for third party access, right? Don't, do, don't let your terminal be dominated by the big three. The big three are Petro China, CNOC, and you know, Sinopec, but because they are owners of the terminal, and they still, until now, do not really have open access. And if they do right now, the latest approach is a very, very, you know, the studio. So again, you have a central directive. People think, oh, this is, you know, communist, you know, everybody got to obey the government. Government gives directive, and none of the top three actually even follow. So, I mean, one, one has to understand China, you know, because it's at, at every level. So, it, you know, so let's not nitpick certain issues over that. Of course, every country has the right over their own the sovereignty. That, that I fully agree. But at the end of the day, let's, let's see how we can trade. Let's see how you can fund our project. And this is not only for Southeast Asia. This can be for Europe. And I think the sooner the Euro, that European... Uh, the politicians come to this realization that, you see, China, when they look into all these things, like, for example, a, a trans pipeline across Central Asia or the, or the rail lines, you must understand they have experienced this already within their own provinces. When China built certain pipelines in their own province, they have to give certain compensation to that province. So they have 
already got that experience and they are transporting that model where it's a win-win situation. And this is why Uzbekistan, the Tajikistan, you know, and the Turk and the and the Turkmenistan, the Kazakhstan, they actually benefit from having certain access through. So again, because it is a commercial venture, is through the SPV in which they are also the shareholder. And this model has worked in China. This is why they are using this on the outside. So it's just not purely over the fact that you're trying to put that country into a debt trap. That, I think, is a, is a misconception. I think the economy in Taiwan is more depends on the politics. I think um, the China and Taiwan relations impact a lot on the economic situation in Taiwan, and uh, which is quite out of the discussions area of here, yes, I think. <laughs>
support your proposal that you can still draw up to you know 30 percent of that currency and right now the amount stands at 240 billion even that is still a small sum compared to the uh, to the actual reserve of each of these countries so these are very innovative mature side and also you have the asian development bank coming up with their own solutions for their project bonds in local currency uh, there Right now, I see the growth has to be also complemented by the capital markets. When you look into all these project funding, infrastructure projects, they are there. But there must be also the growth of the, the capital markets. No countries can just simply afford to do infrastructure projects, including the West. Right? In fact, Asia have handled their infrastructure and acceleration of the infrastructure project development very, very well. But then that begets the question, how do you ex not expose your fiscal policy in terms of your external debt when you have to got to borrow in order to actualize very vital pri that priority infrastructure projects? So <coughs> I have provided certain solutions, like one way is to look into a public-private partnership between state-owned enterprises and the private sector, in which you then that borrowing is not reflected into your public books. But of course, that does not mean that you don't pay for it. There's still a long-term commitment for the government to pay. But this is a means for their own national accounting purposes, whereby it does not show that you have a big spike in terms of your external debt. So there are solutions. There are innovative the solutions uh, over in place. And finally, we, we, we talk about uh, the trade agreements and China, what is the whole role in terms of resources? And in my opinion, China will be the powerhouse for the Asia Pacific. I'm not saying for the whole world, whatever they want to do with their own One Belt uh, objective with Africa, uh, etc., I really do not know. But all I can say, in my view, for certain, is in the Asia Pacific region, which includes Australia and New Zealand, China will be the dominant trade partner. And then look, let's, let's look at ways in which we can utilize all the resources and funds and trade in order for each of these member states to prosper because every government, do not forget, have a responsibility for its own citizen. Young population, there are school leavers, job needs to be created. The, you know, the province, the community level have to meet the 17 sustainable development goals. So I would like, like to end with the fact that uh, that the UN have come up with very, very thorough, very precise, sustainable development goals. And the sooner that can be met, which also includes the you know, climate change, then it's better for the whole world. Thank you.